I came here to Stanley Park mainly because of um, the totem poles and there's one uh, on the side like right here. Mm, what exactly are these totem poles? They were really beautiful and I was fascinated about how they were colored and how they were carved. So totem poles are a monumental type of art and they're unique to the western and the northwestern coastal areas or regions of Canada. So another um, fact that I found out was that these um, totem poles or these carvings are made out of red cedar wood. Uh, so this type of trees and this type of wood is quite abundantly available in the northwest um, coast. So totem poles are not actually gods or they haven't been worshipped by people but um, their importance is that they uh, portray or they display within uh, them um, histories of people, their ancestries, events. Native Americans believed that everyone was connected um, to a certain animal that would um, act like a guide in their life. So um, we see these types of animals being carved out in these totem poles. Like um, the most um, common ones I noticed were the Thunderbird on the top of most totem poles. Uh, but they also represent the uh, people of the Thunderbird clan. When I was actually looking at these totem poles or rather examining them from top to bottom, something that I realized was um, certain symbols or certain so most of the time uh, this has to be mentioned um, the symbols are mostly animals which we call spirit animals and I saw that in most totem poles some animals like one or two animals like the killer whale was um, repetitively seen in most of the poles there's a long list of symbols that the totem poles include so I did the research and there's like a very long list and what all of these um, mean so some of the common symbols or the common figures that we see in these totem poles are the raven and that is the creator. The eagle represents peace and friendship and then we see the killer whale like I mentioned before. The killer whale is a sign of strength and also there are so many others like thunderbird, the beaver, the bear, the wolf and also the frog. When I talk about totem poles, I want to also highlight on uh, certain myths and the facts uh, associated with them. So one big myth that people think about um, totem poles uh, or, they, or something that they believe to be true is that totem poles are a recent introduction uh, to the northwest um, coast or the no northwest region but this is not true. Native northwest coast oral histories tell us that mm, um, totem poles were carved as early as um, 1791 and also the other thing is even I was um, mistaken about this because um, I saw it on one um, web page that uh, just mentioned uh, super casually that totem poles can be read like a book but no, that's a myth. So the fact um, that uh, develops around this is that um, totem poles cannot exactly be read like a book, but um, although uh, you can identify the symbols from top to bottom, uh, what each of them exactly mean, and there's so much of context provided um, into these signs and into these symbols, uh, um, whether they're real or whether they're mythical. Um, so yeah, while you cannot read it um, from top to bottom like a book, while it does not exactly interpret a story, um, you can always um, try to identify a meaning in it. If you know or if you um, uh, try to understand uh, what each of these symbols mean, but it's really difficult to build a story around it without exactly knowing um, what these symbols stand for. Did you know that the totem poles are a Canadian symbol? This is because they serve as important illustrations of the family lineage and the cultural heritage of the indigenous people. So this means that their importance and their meaning goes beyond their beauty. Importance of these totem poles are that um, they were erected um, in the center or within the community back then in the olden times so that it's, it was visible to everyone. These totem poles also marked a family's lineage uh, and they validated the powerful rights and the privileges that were held by these families. Did you ever stop to think how these indigenous artists find the colors to complete their beautiful creations? So if you thought this, you're correct. Natural ingredients, that's what they used. Red and black were the most common colors and black came from grinding soot and red was obtained from a clay-like material called red ochre. As I said, totem poles take up a great part of the Canadian history and the history of the indigenous peoples. They're still being carved today in the present day by modern artists. But that being said, the original and the olden ones that were created by the indigenous artists, are, most of them are preserved for us to see today and some of them are even visible in the Museum of Vancouver. I actually didn't know this until uh, up until my trip to Stanley Park 
um, where on the information posts they had given the due credits to the rightful owners and the rightful artists and they had mentioned when and where these totem poles were actually recreated and um, where their original totem poles are located at right now. Okay, so I'm packing up to go but um, I just want to kind of reiterate on the fact that uh, I chose Stanley Park totem poles as uh, the spot for my uh, indigenous blog. I think that's a good decision. That's a great decision because uh, the entrance was free. And I believe uh, even though it was like a free trip inside here, there was so much to see. There was so much to learn and it's um, all new to me. But I don't feel like it's something that's um, super difficult to understand or to realize because the art around it is like so beautiful. Like if you um, try to get some insights uh, or if you try to realize or if you try to get some understanding or read up a little about it, um, you're going to find it um, to be absolutely beautiful. I think I'm going to say bye to this beautiful place. So I just sat here, uh, I considered it like a resting place where I could sit and do the speeches because um, the area around the totem poles was like quite crowded and I could not really uh, do the speaking part there. But yeah, I can see one from here. Beautiful. to the totem pole's art from the culture of Sri Lanka are other traditional face masks or from our native language which we call as the Vesmuhanu. So these Vesmuhanu or these face masks are meticulously handcrafted pieces of art and they originate from the southern coastal area of Sri Lanka. They are super expensive because of the intricate details and because of the artistry and the craftsmanship that goes behind the making of these masks. And just when I was reviewing Google, I saw that foreigners sell these masks on eBay and Etsy for over $700. Each of these masks tell a unique story. They reveal a rich cultural heritage and a mythical allure in our vibrant island. Just like the totem poles display a variety of different symbols like animals, these Vesmukhunu from Sri Lanka display devils, or we call them Raksha. While there are hundreds of different Vesmukhunu or masks, the most famous out of all of these would be Naga Raksha, the Cobra Devil, the Guinea Raksha, which is the Fire Devil, and the Mayura Raksha, which is the Peacock Devil. I feel these Sri Lankan masks are similar to the totem poles because of their intricate designs and their bold colours. Just like the totem poles have their meaning and their purpose, the Sri Lankan Vesumunu also serve a great purpose for the people of our island. Ancient people believed that these Raksha Vesumunu or these devil face masks had healing powers and protective powers that they would ward off illnesses and also evil. To symbolize this, people would hang these masks in front of their homes, uh, on top of their front doors. In a world where we see tradition and culture slowly dying or fading off, Countries like mine do a lot, do a great deal to preserve these and pass these traditions down the generation. Time to talk about something different from my country in comparison to the indigenous culture here. There is a lot of things I can talk about because Sri Lanka is full of culture, full of tradition. But I would choose something special, the gemstones. Did you know that in the current context, Sri Lanka is ranked as one of the single most important sources of gemstones? The first gem mining evidence of Sri Lanka dates as far back as the 3rd century BC. The well-known fact that tourists from all over the world visit Sri Lanka just for the purpose of buying gemstones. We in Sri Lanka have an abundant resource of the sapphires, the blue, yellow, pink, you name it. Ruby, almondine, azonite, garnet and also funny but the name but Padbarasha. Ratnapura, or translated as the City of Gems, is a township in South Central Sri Lanka which is distinguished for its bountiful resources in fine corundum gems that some of those are even being sold for over a million dollars per carat across the globe. Now here's a pretty fun fact. Do you know about one of the most recognizable or world famous engagement ring designs that shook the world? Does this ring a bell? Sure it does. A ring of a similar design was what then Prince Charles used to propose to Princess Diana. Ever since then, ladies throughout the world have been using this design for their rings. So the fun part is, where did this very famous and beautiful gemstone come from? Surely it came from Sri Lanka. This 12 carat oval Ceylon sapphire was mined from Sri Lanka and back in 1981 it was valued at over a whopping 37,500 US dollars. 
I think that sums up something different but unique to the culture of Sri Lanka. So with that, I'm concluding the first ever vlog I've done in my life for over three days. Signing off.